Uh, that brings me to the uh, heart of the agenda, which is our friends at UC San Francisco. So Dr. Souza, I'll pass it over to you. Great, thank you, Andy. And um, thank you to Amy and the rest of the organizers for um, having us here and inviting us. Let me make sure I'm sharing sound. We're gonna start with a quick video, um, about a minute and a half or so, and then I'll get into my presentation. Um, Andy, just give me a thumbs up if you can hear it when I start playing. We can hear you. It's predicted that 50% of adults will have knee replacement surgery procedures. Somewhere between 10 and 20% of patients still have problems after surgery. What we've never had before is the ability to track how people do over time on a continuous basis. We can reserve standard equipment resources like the 3D Gate Biomechanics Lab for those individuals that most need it. However, it's not enough. What we really need to know is what people are doing in the real world. We can do so much more on very inexpensive and very easily accessible computing hardware, such as the one we're using in a Google Tag. The goal of this early R&D project is to see if we can use our custom neural network architecture to replicate the same type of analysis in the lab outside in the real world. What the AI team at ATAP was able to do is match our 3D biomechanics data to within one degree throughout the entire gate profile. I didn't really think that was going to be possible. We're on the cusp of a revolution about how we think about patient care. All right, so um, as uh, you saw a little bit in that video, um, I do gate biomechanics. So I'm a professor at UCSF, like Andy mentioned, and the image that you see in the middle of the screen is um, kind of a representation of somebody walking in the lab, and, and we can very carefully measure the kinematics and the kinetics as somebody moves throughout the laboratory. In most of our biomechanics study, we include additional aspects that describe how the person is functioning, whether it's strength testing in the top right or EMG in the bottom right. We can look at things like balance, like we're showing in the top left here, or a test like knee stability, like you see in the bottom left. And this does a pretty good job at evaluating knee function. But there's a big problem in the, in the world of orthopedics, and um, one of that is how people are doing longitudinally. And one thing that we know, oops, one thing that we know is that knee replacement surgeries happen at a really high rate, as Dr. Beanie said in that video, and most do pretty well, but not everybody. Um, and this becomes a problem when after some period of time, patients are dealing with um, lack of satisfaction at their level of function following surgery. And there's been a lot of work in this space. And we do know which deficits exist following knee function, and during that recovery period, which deficits do lead to long-term poor outcomes. And the research has, has come out over the last 25 years and does a pretty good job at pointing us in the right direction. Um, studies have come out in lots of different areas to show us what the deficits are, and some of those are listed here. Outcomes following total knee, re um, knee replacement or total knee arthroplasty, um, show deficits in reduced knee flexion moments, Abnormal, abnormalities in reduced knee flexion angular excursion or angular velocity, ground reaction force measures, hip, hip joint moments and stride asymmetry are all features that show abnormalities in people who have poor function and also predict those who are gonna go on to have poor outcomes over time. So the great thing is that we do a pretty good job of measuring these things in our lab and Brooke and her team um, um, have, you know, uh, fantastic facilities to be able to record these things in these subjects. Um, but it comes at really high cost. The motion capture lab is not inexpensive. The equipment cost is certainly north of $100,000. The time to collect a single subject is about three to four hours by the time you calibrate and place the markers and all the things that you have to do. And then once you have the data collected, the processing is another big um, burden. You have four to six hours of processing um, before we even get any measurable data. So there's some real challenges there. Ultimately, there are two massive gaps in our current clinical practice. The first one is access. Coming to the laboratory with all those time and, and finance burdens is not part of clinical practice. Very few patients that have a total knee replacement or have any surgery for that matter come through a 3D gate laboratory. So if you're part of a research study, you might, but it's not very common. Second is it's extremely artificial. 
we have people come in and they walk, but they walk on a perfectly flat surface. We might let them walk at their own self-selected speed, but we have them go upstairs. We have them do a sit to stand. None of that might be what they're doing in the real world. And so it's a very artificial environment. So two things that we need, we need to, we need to provide access to more people and we need real world environment. And that's this large unmet clinical need to identify how people are functioning and quantify recovery of knee function in the real world. Well, wearable sensors exist. They've existed for quite a while. This is not new. However, this partnership that UCSF has developed with the Google ATAP team is really exciting because it's, it's adding in advances in machine learning and then the computing power to be able to make real advances on our understanding of how the knee is functioning over time in the real world. So with that, I'm gonna pass it on to our next presenter. Is that Brooke? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's me. Hi, everybody. Um, just wanted to provide a little bit of context behind what Rich just presented. So you got a visual about what it actually means to come into the lab and do a full gait analysis. Um, and on the, as mentioned in the very first slide, once we bring somebody in, given the amount of effort it takes to come in, we typically do a lot more than just gait. We have them do strength. We have them do functional testing. We do a lot more tasks because it is pretty um, time intensive to get them in here. We might as well get as much as we can from them on site. So this is um, an example here of somebody in a full motion capture set. This is a um, trunk and lower body. So you can see they are fairly well exposed as we do go skin placed markers to get our most accurate um, tracking of their, their limbs and their segments. Um, so again, this does that access element Rich mentioned is critical as there's a lot of people who are just frankly not comfortable coming in and doing this. So um, providing an opportunity to get out of lab um, data with, uh, in home environments would again enhance our work greatly. No slide. Particular to this project, we are doing our full motion capture in addition to placing nine of the um, jacquard tags on the body. So I'll let Nick um, mention a little bit more detail about the tag itself. But you can see that we have a, a large black cluster with reflective balls on there. Those are gonna be placed on the large body segments. We have individual markers placed directly on the skin um, due to bony landmarks. And then we're placing nine tags bilaterally in these locations here on the screen to match the, the segments of um, pelvis and lower body. Slide. And then ultimately, um, here's an example of our final outcome. So this, this little skeleton model that you see is an end result after data capture, cleaning up uh, motion capture data processing, and then putting it through our software to calculate um, joint angles, joint moments, and forces. So we get a model, 3D model, of what the person has been doing in the lab. And for this study, we've been doing sort of activities of daily living for this post rehab group of walking, stairs, sit to stand, um, and that those outcome measures. Slide and to Nick. Thank you both. Um, so on this slide, you can see um, an example of the type of data that's coming out of uh, the GitLab. So at the on, at the top of the screen here, you can see one of the key variables that might come from a two second walking period. period. So specifically, this is the right knee angular velocity. Uh, and you can see in orange here, the uh, signal that's coming from uh, the GitLab system that uh, Brooke and Rich uh, were, were covering. And then below this, you can see uh, two examples of the time series data that comes from the Jacquard uh, tag sensor. So essentially inside the tag, we have a, an inertial sensor that can uh, output a time series of accelerometer and, and gyro data. Um, and in this case, you can see the three axis accelerometer for one of the tags that's placed on the thigh and the same thing for the tag uh, gyroscope data that corresponds to this two seconds of, um, of walking strides. So um, here the goal is essentially, um, how can we use machine learning to take this very noisy um, uh, sensor data from one or multiple tags and actually uh, project this into the same subspace so we essentially can pull out variables like knee angular velocity, 
or ground reaction force or some of the other key variables we'll talk about in a moment. And actually, there's kind of a hint at the top of this here. You can see in, 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 in the orange, the UCSF GitLab, and in blue, the output of our neural networks. And that's directly mapping here from the inertial time series data. So let's talk a little bit about how we're actually doing that. So if we go to the next slide, you can see um, our core uh, neural network architecture that's allowing us to do this mapping from the raw time series of data into one or more of these key variables like knee angular velocity, ground reaction force, hip moment, and so forth. And um, the best way to think about this is this is using similar techniques um, that's used today for modern language translation, where you want to take maybe some text that's, for example, in English, and you want to translate that to, say, Spanish, and then take that and translate it to German, and then German to French, and then maybe French back into English again. It's using very similar techniques, but now, instead of uh, mapping uh, languages in a text domain, we can now actually take time series sensor data and actually map this into these key variables that doctors and surgeons are interested in analyzing. So if we look at the next slide, we can kind of peek inside the box here. So there are three key components to the sequence to sequence model. The first one is our encoder. And the goal of the encoder is to use a large amount of unlabeled data to train these very rich representations of the raw sensor data to start to make these problems easier. And the outcome of the encoder, if you can go to the next slide, Rich, um, you can see that this essentially takes this um, very rich temporal sequence and projects it into what we call a latent time series. And the way to think about this is that um, with this unlabeled data, this is essentially compressing the information down into these kind of key temporal uh, time steps that allow us to make um, uh, uh, these type of prediction problems much easier because we're learning the kind of the, the very rich representation of how the sensor sees the world. And we can do all of this with without any labels from the motion capture system. So this is where we bring in step three, which is we can now on top of this uh, latent time series, start to add these decoders, which can actually uh, pr uh, project the latent time series into the subspace that we care about. So this could be, for example, uh, a decoder that would actually give you output of knee angular velocity. And for the decoder part, this is actually where we need a small amount of kind of golden ground truth. And this is what we would get from, from, from Brooke. What the, this is what the uh, kind of uh, motion capture uh, gate analysis system would provide as a reference for the model to learn on top of. And the nice thing about this architecture is um, twofold. The first one is a large amount of the lower la layers, the encoder and the latent time series can be learned without any labels, which means that it's very efficient to get this type of data. And number two, we can have multiple decoders sit on top of the same model. So we can have one decoder for knee angular velocity, another decoder for hip moment, another decoder for um, the peak uh, swing and the gate phase and, and all of these type of things. So depending on the task, we can actually hook in these different decoders, which makes these models very powerful. If we go to the next slide, uh, you can see a few examples of the type of outputs here. So uh, here you can see uh, the uh, predictions for uh, knee angular velocity. Um, and uh, again, the ground truth labels are in red here, and then the model's predictions are in blue. Um, if we look at the next slide, we can look at what the output is for the knee angle. And there's a very interesting trend here at the bottom where you can see that the ground truth labels in red only capture a subset of the temporal sequence. And th this is expected because uh, the user is actually walking through a kind of laser gate uh, and Brooks team captures a number of steps and then they kind of walk out again. So the, uh, the motion capture system isn't capturing every single stride they make in the space. This is quite normal. But um, you can see the major benefit of using these small inertial sensors worn on the body that even if the user walks outside of the gate lab, the models are still able to accurately track and predict their motion. So this is extremely useful because this gets back to one of the key points that Rich was making earlier, which is this allows us to actually take the, the same algorithms and tags and actually run these in the wild um, outside of these uh, you know, large clinical labs to allow uh, doctors and surgeons to kind of monitor uh, patients' recovery uh, after they've had surgery without them having to come back into the gate lab. So that, that's a major win. If we look at the next slide, uh, you can see one of the harder examples uh, for, for this type of inertial sensor to predict, which is the knee moment. So this is actually combining both the kinetics and the kinematics that come from the GitLab to estimate the, uh, the 
uh, the key moment of, of the knee. And you can see that the error for this type of prediction with our inertial sensors is, is, is higher, but we can still do a fairly good job of predicting the mean kind of trajectory. So there's still useful information here for doctors, particularly if you combine this with say knee angular velocity where the error is much closer to one or 2%. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, here you can see how all of this kind of joins together. So um, you can see uh, our, uh, the Google Jacquard tag on the far left, on the far right of the system. Um, the tag itself, uh, I already mentioned, has an, an, an embedded uh, uh, inertial sensor, which is giving us the acceler accelerometer and gyro data. It also has a small microcontroller, so we can actually run our uh, neural network models directly on the tag if we need to, or just simply use it to do data collection. It has a small amount of embedded uh, flash, and then it can talk to a mobile app via Bluetooth, which then connects directly to the Google, uh, Google Cloud and securely pushes data up to the cloud buckets that only the UCSF team can access. Um, from this, we then do a, a, a number of pre-processing and analytics steps, for example, synchronizing the data of the Google uh, tag with uh, other tags or synchronizing the, the data between the tags and the GitLab system. So we actually have a one-to-one -one mapping. Um, from this, we can then train and uh, analyze our models. And then um, the power of the cloud is that this actually allows us to take these models and export them and run them directly on the, 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 the tags if needed. Um, to actually do the real-time inference directly on the tag without having to uh, necessarily have the cloud connection all the time, because obviously that's um, quite expensive from a PAR perspective if you have that Bluetooth connection all the time. So um, this is kind of the full end-to-end -end cycle of the PAR uh, that the cloud brings us in terms of getting the, the best out of these small, uh, low-cost inertial sensors and uh, taking you know, these very powerful machine learning models that can actually accurately replicate uh, the outputs of the GitLab. So with that, I think uh, we're gonna turn over to the next team.